Colleen McKeegan became a fast friend of mine when we joined the same fiction workshop group in the thick of the pandemic in 2020. Since then, she has been vital in my edits to my own novel in progress and an inspiration for her extreme dedication to writing and her obvious talent. I could not be prouder to host her here for her debut novel, which has been reviewed and featured literally everywhere. And it's a book that pretty much everyone in the country agrees is the perfect summer read. So a summer publication is perfect for this book. Colleen's book, The Wild One, is a twisted and thrilling coming-of-age story about a young woman hiding a dark secret that dates all the way back to her days at summer camp. The truth threatens to ruin our protagonist, Amanda's, relationship with her boyfriend and turn her life upside down. But can she trust the only two people who know her monstrous past? Moderating tonight's conversation is DC's own Vera Kurian, whose first book, Never Saw Me Coming, is the perfect companion to The Wild One, in my opinion. It's set on a fictional college campus, and the story follows a groundbreaking clinical study of psychopaths. What could go wrong? Uh, and one student is suddenly found murdered. Shocker. The psychopaths killed someone. <laughs> Uh, but what follows is thrilling and tons of twists and turns. And like I said, it's the perfect book to read with Colleen's. I read Never Saw Me Coming when it first came out and I couldn't put it down. So I highly suggest you pick up both of these titles, go home, put your PJs on, and then just call in sick to work tomorrow because you're just going to be up all night reading them. <laughs> so just go ahead and do that now. Okay, without further ado, please help me welcome Colleen McKeegan and Vera Kurian to Politics and Prose. Okay. Oh, you can hear me well. Okay. Hey, guys. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for coming out. Um, why don't you start with a pitch for someone who doesn't know anything about your book? In your okay. own words, I was what is say, your book about? Um, well, I think everybody in this audience definitely knows plenty about my book. But it um, essentially, The Wild One is an exploration of, well, it is a summer camp story about a summer camp experience gone wrong. Um, and really it's about our protagonist, Amanda, and her two friends, Catherine and Meg, and how the three of them essentially are finding themselves and um, figuring out their places in the world, um, sort of in the, with a backdrop of childhood trauma and how it impacts all of the decisions that they make from this one summer that they had that went just completely sideways, um, where I'm not spoiling anything, but within the first you know two pages of the book, you know that they killed somebody um, that first summer at camp, and essentially how it impacts all of their lives, the decisions that they make, the relationships that they have, their relationships with one another, um, and really what I wanted to explore with the book was um, sort of how sometimes that trauma can beget trauma and how you sort of overcome it. Great, thank you. Um, so we're gonna have you read for a few minutes, okay. uh, just to tee up the rest of the Q. Okay, here we go. Um, okay, so I'm starting at the very beginning of the book, and this is chapter one. Let me get it. Okay. I practiced this for Kelly, my sister, so hopefully I sound very good. Um, the three of us hadn't been together in real life since that first summer. That was by design, at least on my part. I didn't want to talk about the thing that bonded us, the thing we swore as girls to never tell anyone. Not the police, who were happy enough to say it was the alcohol abuse that caused a seizure, which led to the fall, which led to his death. Not our family, or friends, or the expensive lawyers my parents hired to represent me and Catherine, or the one Meg's aunt hired to represent her. It was easy to write off a man like him, so everyone did. They weren't wrong, not exactly, but they missed a few key details, namely the trigger, which Catherine took care of for me. We hardly knew Meg, and Catherine, after the way I treated her, should have prayed for my downfall. But we all played a part in what happened that summer, and so we shared the burden of silence. For years, the three of us were the only ones who knew that I'm the one who killed him. And now I'm back in the same woods where it began, once again helpless beneath towering oaks and elms and pines. They whispered to each other like they, too, want to unleash the truth. It was Meg's idea to meet here. She's still local, working as a waitress at the casino resort about 20 miles down the road. So much of this place is a wasteland, but the slots still draw a regular stream of tourists and with them Meg's income. We talked on the phone last week, our first and only call, 
their voices at once strange and familiar. And she told us she needed the tips for her, sat for her Saturday brunch and Sunday afternoon shifts to cover her rent. Catherine and I are both grad students, she in Boston and me in New York, so we agreed. We'd road trip to the Poconos, to the place where he died. A funeral for our past, Meg said, her voice graining on the other end of the line. I wasn't really sure what to bring to a funeral that should have happened over a decade ago. I shoved a fifth of vodka and a few cans of Diet Coke inside my tote bag, in the likely case that things got awkward. When I dressed in the frigid air conditioning of my bedroom that morning, a black sleeveless maxi dress seemed like an appropriate outfit choice. But I regret the decision as the sun bears down on the dark fabric. Sweat slides along my spine, pulling where my skin meets my underwear, a reminder that the shade in these particular woods offers no protection. I unfold the blanket I packed, the fleece one we huddled under as kids hours after we watched his head split open, the only thing I kept from that summer. Still glued to one corner, the faded tag reads, Amanda Brooks. At the time, I convinced myself I kept the blanket because it was my mom's, a hand-me-down from her stint at camp. In this light, the early June sky is merciless as it was in 2003, I worry it's a trophy, a twisted souvenir to always remind me of the evil that lurks beneath the neatly polished facade I've carefully built. I brought nothing else to sit on, though, so I tossed the blanket messily against the forest floor, rocks and sticks poking their craggy shapes into my tailbone as I'm cross-legged and waiting. We kept our secret for more than 10 years, until I didn't, and I learned why we promised to never tell. Thank you. <laughs> so um, this is your debut novel, but yes. not your first publication, as you are a, also a journalist. So why this book in particular? Why this story? So it's funny. Um, I had worked on, as I'm sure you had as well, like some different ideas uh, while I was working full time. Um, and I initially came up with not so much the idea, but the setting for this book in, uh, gosh, probably 2016. Mm -hmm. I had been dating my now husband for about two years. And as I mentioned, like I, I was trying some different projects in my free time and I was just like, oh, 50 pages in, this is horrible, scrap. Like say, a lot of them were set in New York because that was my life at the time. Um, a lot of auto fiction as well. And I'm um, really glad I didn't go that route. <laughs> but, um, but I was definitely trying it. And um, Pat, my, my husband, his family rents a house at Lake Wallenpaw Pack in the Poconos every single summer. It's like instead of doing holidays together, they do basically like the 4th of July. And that's sort of like their Christmas or Thanksgiving or, or whatnot because they have a huge family. So every single family member rents a house and we all get together. And the first year, 2014, when we started dating, I went and I realized the house we had rented was a mile if maybe two miles away from this all girls summer camp I had gone to for five summers growing oh. up. I had not been back to that area probably since we went to camp. It's my sister, so <laughs> she can verify. <laughs> and I forced Pat to go with me to this all girls camp, um, which I think was slightly horrifying for him because everywhere oh. he went, they would just shout, man in the row. And it was, but I- The camp I, still existed. Oh, it still exists. Oh. And it's, it's called Camp Onika. Um, and I actually just went back there about two weeks ago with, with the book and, oh. and to meet with everybody. But it was funny because I was a total camp person and loved my summers there and had spent five summers there and just like talked about it to everyone. And even I remember there was one time in college my freshman year where um, like my, some of my friends convinced me to drink a bit too much and then put on all of my camp gear that I still had. Like it was, that's how intensely dedicated I was to it. And um, it was funny going back there. It was just so calming, I guess, to return to this place that I had associated so many great memories with, but also a feeling of safety and a feeling of belonging, um, a feeling of development and, and growing up. Um, and so, of course, in sort of my own twisty way, I decided I need to create, recreate that safe space and then find a way to like pop it a little bit yeah. and flip it upside down. Um, so that was really 2016 was when I first thought I want to set a novel in this space. Um, and I didn't fully know if it was going to be, um, you know, what the genre would be, I mm -hmm. guess. But I knew that I liked the setting. And then 2018 was really when I like committed to the storyline that eventually became the wild one. Yeah. I mean, you sort of answered my next question, which was, when I read the book, I was like, this is clearly someone who went to camp and loved it. <laughs> those, those scenes felt very like lived in. Like yeah. this, and I think, I mean, I never got to go to camp. I was not allowed. 
But I think that people that didn't go to camp think of people who went to camp as like they're all talking like they've been in this cult together and this is an amazing <laughs> I was experience. Say we're a unique, a un- but, unique personality. <laughs> yeah, and it seems like it would have been really fun. I wish yeah. I could have gone, and you clearly felt that way. And then it was so. Do you went when you were around the same age as the characters? Yeah. So I went from the age, I was nine through thirteen. Um, and so I kind of, it was interesting when I was figuring out what age I wanted the girls to be. Um, funny enough, at camp, a lot of the, I, certainly I, I really, um, I, I would say I took it up a notch in terms of any of the meanness or the conflict mm-hmm. that was happening. Um, but the funny thing about camp in general, especially at that age, is just that you don't have sort of the parental guidance and supervision that you would like with a conflicted school, for instance. And that age is so brutal. Like there's so much casual cruelty where you don't even realize that you're being hurtful, but like your brain's still developing and you're just impulsive and say things that you might not mean or, you know, all of that. And so it was funny when I was thinking back on my own time at camp where I had these amazing friendships, but I also, I I wrote a piece for Al about being a camp person um, ahead of the publication of The Wild One. And I mentioned a game we played when I was 12 at camp. And it was just called, What I Don't Like About You. (laughs) And we each wrote one thing about each person in our cabin that we didn't like. (laughs) And that was it. That was the game. (laughs) That was it. (laughs) And, And like we went around. And it was funny because like I don't even remember what people wrote about me. But I just, I remember the feeling of the conversation and us like also basically playing that and then being like, okay, time to go play soccer together, <laughs> and that was it. And it was just bizarre, but that's such like a camp kind of um, thing. And and my camp in particular, I think, was, um, especially because it was all girls, um, the the bonds were so deep. And I, I mean, I, I'm actually bummed because when this was the earlier event, one of my camp friends was actually planning to come, but she literally had a baby two days ago. Um, and it's just, it's just really, really funny because like the, it, it wasn't so much that we like had shared trauma in any way, but we just like, you know, it, we all became so close so fast. It's like that early time in college where yeah. you're just thrown into this unfamiliar situation um, and kind of forced to like learn everything about one another. Um, and so I, yeah, I really wanted to kind of capture that and I hope I did. In, yeah, in the book. I think you did. Um, one of the things I'm always interested in books that touch on the topic of relational aggression, which, yeah. you know, boys tend to do more of the physical aggression and girls tend to do more of the relational aggression. Um, And uh, Amanda, the main character, is like, she's not the most popular girl, but she's not just a follower because she also takes some impetus on her own. Um, So how did you think about formulating her as a main character and who you wanted to be at the center of the story? Yeah, so it's funny. In early drafts of the book, I actually had alternating POVs. Mm -hmm. Um, So I had Amanda... Meg, Catherine, and Larry, actually, who ends up in in the final version has been a little bit more of a peripheral character. Um, But I sort of had like different perspectives from them, especially during their time at camp. Um, And when I was workshopping it early on, uh, the two strongest voices that I had feedback on were Catherine and Amanda. And everybody was just like, those two are where, it seems like your your passion really is, or at least like your um, interest. And so Amanda for me, Part of why I think I wanted to center the book around her perspective was because, as you mentioned, she's a follower and she's driven by sort of this desperate and I think very relatable desperation. It's an extreme, but sort of that relatable need to fit in that a lot of young girls feel. Um, And a lot of women in their early 20s feel as well in a whole different way, whether it's at your job or in a relationship or in a new city, like just kind of maybe making the wrong decisions for the wrong reasons. and for, for me, Amanda felt somewhat familiar because I kind of saw a little bit of her in a lot of people I knew, including myself. And, you know, I always say when certain things in my life happened when I was growing up and I took a right, I kind of made Amanda take a left. Um, and so I, I think part of why I found her to be fun to build the story around was because there was just this constant desperation that she just couldn't seem to shake. And the more she leans into it, 
the more it sort of becomes this core part of her identity and keeps becoming this really, really um, problematic cycle that obviously follows her into her 20s and into her relationship with Jackson. Um, and I just, for me personally, I, I find that type of cycle something that I am really interested in unpacking and understanding um, why it happens and, and just quite honestly why in my early 20s so many of my friends and other women I knew and coworkers and whatnot found ourselves in these like not great situations, how do we get there, you know? And Amanda felt to me like a great way to explore that path or potential of that yeah, path. She's She's not necessarily admirable, but she's definitely relatable. Yes. Like she, I hope she feels real. That's what yeah. I, I, I know she's not likable. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I totally know she's unlikable, but, um, but I wanted her to feel flawed and real. And, you know, each of the characters, I think they, um, there's a part of them that I hope feels familiar to everyone where you kind of know who that person was yeah. in certain social circles. Yeah. And she's drawn, she's drawn to popular girls, um, even if they might burn her. I just want to read a couple sentences from, from page 20. She's talking about Sarah, the, the popular girl at college. Camp, sorry. <laughs> she was one of those girls who seemed to have a gravity about them, pulling you in with their prettiness, trapping you with their bossiness, winning you over with her adoration. The sudden didn't just follow Sarah. She directed its every move. She reminded me of Rachel, her other popular friend. Beaming and envy-inducing radiance, I wanted to make mine. And it's really interesting in contrast to the other people present in in their cabin, you know, um, Catherine, who's this kind of like brainy, maybe nerdy, Larry, who kind of strikes you as a tomboy, and then Sydney. And, you know, Larry and Sydney strike me as the sort of people that maybe if you were a little older, you'd pick them to be. Yes. Like they're yes. the they're totally self-confident, don't care. Yeah. But she's drawn to Sarah specifically, mm -hmm. and it's like she can sense that like radiance that might burn me thing right and she's right. attracted to it yeah which um it's a power thing a little bit too yeah. it's this idea that oh well everybody's looking at her i want to be next to that yeah um but it is funny as you mentioned with like larry and sydney um you know and even barrett right like the other friend who um at one of my earlier events somebody asked me like who's your favorite character and i was like sydney i think yeah. <laughs> like it's like the peripheral person who but it's just funny because as you mentioned like those are the girls that I think when sometimes, you know, even looking back on my own decisions when I was in like middle school or, or high school and thinking about who I chose to hang yeah. out with versus who, weirdly enough, like especially through Instagram and things like class friends who I maybe didn't hang out with socially, now I'm really close with. Like it's a very funny thing where just our maturity maybe wasn't aligned yeah. and then suddenly now we're like, oh my gosh, we should have been like best yeah. friends in, in high school. And it's just very, very funny how that works. I think, was Sydney the one whose boyfriend broke up with her and then she was like, LOL? Yeah. Like, like that was like, <laughs> I like her. Yes. <laughs> she thinks yes. that's funny rather than <laughs> devastating. Um, so the characters are 12 and I want to talk about why you made the decision to have them be 12 as opposed to 14 or 16 where you might enter into like different territory in terms of like puberty. Yeah. Um, I think 12 at least in my own life, um, is a really great age where you're on the cusp of um, sort of that pre-adulthood phase or you're still, I don't want to, I mean, this is cliche, but like you're on the edge of innocence in a way, right? Where um, depending on where you're at in life, and this is a very privileged setting that these girls are in. So I felt that 12 in particular for them because one would assume if they're at this summer camp that they probably are at in pretty sort of like sheltered neighborhoods or at least like sheltered lifestyles of some kind. Um, you know, like these are not like tough girls, right? Like they're, they're girls who pretty much are like not needing much in life. And so 12 to me felt like, like it, it's right before they start like some of them developing, like suddenly you're, you don't really have as much of the male gaze on you at that age. Um, there's just a, a female gaze. Yes, not plenty male. of female gaze, but not male gaze as much. Um, and you're you're really, um, you know, trying to, but you're also your your mind and your understanding of your role in the world is starting to like the wheels are turning. And um, you know, junior high, like my sisters and I always joke that like seventh grade for all of us was the worst year ever. Like, and I don't know, I say that, but people always laugh, but it's like so true. I don't know what it is about seventh grade. It's like, can we just skip it always? Um, but I always think about how that was the year for um, a lot of 
myself and my friends and my, my family where, you know, suddenly things started changing, I guess, where whether it was like people started getting like significant others or you had to go to dances. Like there was just all of this, I don't want to say it's sexual pressure, but it just, it was a changing dynamic of who we were in the world. Where like a, a year before, it was cool to be playing with like American Girl dolls yeah. or like Legos in our basement, and it was great and it was so fun. And then suddenly, it's like that's not cool, and we need to like all go to dances and try and meet people and like be very awesome. Um, and so, to me, I felt like that age at camp where you're in this sort of weird stalled place of growth. Like every time I went to camp, I felt like was sort of like reverted a little bit more to like the basics in terms of it was just like fun and pure um i wanted to kind of explore that where there's this tension between who these girls are outside of the walls of camp and then who they are within camp and what they bring and what they kind of create as well yeah i think people that age always have this or maybe even as old as going to college have this attraction to the idea of i'm going to a new place i can completely be a different person yes. but you actually are who you are. Yes. You know. And and it comes out too. I mean, we um, in the LPs as well. I, I talked about how there were girls at the summer camp I went to that would like completely create like new identities in a way when they were there. And sometimes this was through um, like I remember this one girl who she would bring pictures of like this guy and she was never in the pictures with him, but like he was her boyfriend. <laughs> and then there like and there was other people who like, in yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> like it's, it's, and then there were other people who would, they had famous relatives or they had broken all these records and whatnot. And this is, you know, I was at camp in the era like pre-social media era. Yeah. There was no way to fact check any of this. So some people got away with it. Some people didn't. I had two sisters there, so like I got away with none of that. <laughs> um, but it just was very funny because I, I thought a little bit about that as well as I was creating this world of. Um, you know, camp always felt like a blank slate, you know, especially when you were new there. And the later you joined, the harder it was to find your crew because there were people who had gone there for so long together and had their connections. But, um, but it still was funny because sometimes like these newbies would come in and they would just, as you mentioned, they would want to create like a splash or a big identity and have people gravitate toward them. And it was always interesting to see who it worked for and who it didn't, you know? Um, and so I think there's a little bit of that. Catherine was interesting for me because I, I just, I wanted her of all of them to just be the most authentic to herself. Like she always is just like, this is who I am. Yeah. Take it or leave it. Um, and that was fun to write too because I just, um, I sort of always liked how just, you know, authentic sort of pure in a way she was at that age um and she's been a really interesting character to get people's take on because i always say she's like a litmus test where some people are like oh yikes and some are like i, I still really like her you know and it's it's just been um really interesting again to kind of see how different people what they take and how they gravitate towards different characters yeah by the end of the book i wondered who in your mind was the titular wild one because my thought on that change from beginning to end yeah yeah you know it's funny I so my original title when I sold it was wildflowers oh. and that was based on the Dolly Parton song that I have in the in the the book um, and I love the lyrics of that song and how the message of it is essentially that um, you know there were the the protagonist of that song is like kind of thrown in any situation and she grow, you know, she grew up fast and wild, but no matter where she's planted, she can thrive and survive. Um, and I felt that for each of the characters was so true, right? Like they're all kind of figuring it out in a messy way, but they're trying to do that. And um, with the wild one, it was funny when, I, when my editor had suggested that title, I was like, who do we think like the wild one is? Yeah. And we talked about it right. and she's like, I feel like we can leave it up to the reader. Um, but for me, I will say, I don't think it's Amanda. I kind of, in a way, think it could be the men of the book. Oh. Um, just because I feel like they're truly the messiest. They're messy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, I don't know. I, I think it's it's sort of in different ways it can apply to like the different um, characters at different parts points in their life, you know. Yeah. Um, but I don't. I maybe it's because my editor 
and I, when we first discussed it, we didn't explicitly pick, pick somebody. One. I don't have a single character in mind that I'm like, this is absolutely that. Yeah, I don't think there's a correct, I, I thought it was Meg because yeah. she is just this feral, like doesn't care. Yeah. She's not even part of the social system um, and is just existing in this other right. plane. But right. you could easily see it being like any Being of any of them. Yeah, and it's, it's funny when you say that too because it's like, I, especially when she's at camp, when she's 12, yeah. she is just, I always kind of had this, I think part of why I, I gave her red hair is because I kind of always imagined her as like Pippi Longstocking. Mm -hmm. She has that vibe, you know? Yeah. Um, and again, that's like one of the things I really like about her too. Yeah. So after these, uh, the this killing, which occurs at the camp, Amanda grows up to be this very self-conscious, perfectionistic um, individual. She's in a relationship with a man who's perfect on paper, but maybe isn't. Uh, I was thinking uh, towards the very end of the book, this is not a spoiler, there's a part where she says, yet part of me, a part bigger than I like to admit, missed the drama that came with messiness. I wondered sometimes, like, to what extent would Amanda be in the same position if this killing hadn't occurred? Yeah. Um, would she, because before the killing occurred, she had some issues with relational aggression at school, yeah. which is why she's sent to camp initially. Mm -hmm. So I wondered, like, to what extent did this change the trajectory of her life? I think if anything, it it created, um, and I'm sure there would have been something else in her life that less intense and scary, um, but that she would have felt she needed to fix. And that to me is what Amanda in her 20s that's what leads her to Jackson is this idea that like I need him to fix mm -hmm. me mm -hmm. I can't fix myself um and I I do think that that persona or that, that that idea I guess is not uncommon for a lot of people at that age because you're just really figuring out who you are um for many of us we had been in sort of school for this whole time and and had structure and guidance and certainly made mistakes along the way, but but we're sort of told like, this is what's next. And then suddenly you're like thrown into the real world and a lot of times you're flailing, right? Especially in a place like New York that's just kind of yeah. big and vicious and um, can like easily chew you up and spit you out. And I, I think I agree with this kind of what, what you're hinting at of like, Amanda probably would have ended up with someone like Jackson um, or at least somebody who, I, I think there's, um, a graph I have in the book about how she has always kind of attached herself to big personalities, to people where in a way she can, she's just sort of like, not a parasite necessarily, mm -hmm. but kind of clinging on to them and isn't, isn't really like a whole person on her own. She yeah. doesn't really stand on her own two feet without being able to like lean on somebody else. Um, and listen, I think there are a lot of people who go about their life, their whole lives that way. Yeah. Um, and for me, what was important with the plot line of, of this story was getting Amanda to a point where she's not whole by the end of the book, but she's trying to be. She's trying for the first time to figure out how do I move forward without just latching myself on to somebody else? Um, and how do I accept the fact that like I don't necessarily need to be fixed, or if I do, I have to do it myself. Um, and and I, I saw a lot of that type of development among so many people in my life from their you know, post-college years to where we are now in life. And um, I wanted to capture, I think, that, that journey a bit in a much, much more intense way um, and much shorter timeline in the book as well. Yeah, it definitely seems like some people struggle a lot with identity in their tweens, teenage, 20s, and other people are just very certain about who they are, yeah. kind of like right away, like you were saying about yeah. Catherine. Um, related to that, um, which of the cabin girls do you relate to most? gosh so I was there is a little bit of me in all of them um I will say Catherine pre uh some of her darker moments in the <laughs> book um sort of her pure like nerdiness and all that a lot of that was inspired by my husband who was an eagle scout and uh -huh. was like a very nerdy uh younger kid the bird he really did every time too. truly like every time I had a question about like where moss would grow in a tree or anything like that I'd be like Pat can you, can you help me out here um, so it's funny because I think um, Catherine in general, uh, again, the earlier versions of her um, were sort of, there's less of me in her than I think probably Pat. 
And then um, I like Barrett, Catherine's best friend. I just like the two of them. Like, I love the combo of them. I would honestly, like, watch a show about those two, at, like, exploring the woods together. Um, and Sydney's funny because a few people who have read it have actually texted me and been like, are you Sydney? Because <laughs> I, she's from the Lehigh Valley. She, like, there were certain things that were about her where I think I probably took her and Larry in particular, I probably took a lot of the actual traits of girls at Onika, the camp that we had gone to, and thrown them in them. Um, but I think in terms of, like, Sarah, Amanda um, in particular, I don't have that much in common with Sarah, but I have had some friends who are very much Sarah and, um, and have outgrown their Sarah phases, Hopefully. and some who really leaned <laughs> into them and never changed. Um, but it's funny because Sarah, that's why I think for me, Sarah felt really familiar because I, I just knew so many kind of versions of her. I think every girl. Every, yeah, everybody kind of knows that person. Um, and then ultimately, especially because I spent you know so much time writing from the perspective of Amanda, um, I think there's a lot of me and Amanda as well. Less, as I mentioned, like the pure sort of desperation or whatnot, but this idea of, um, like there were certain situations I would put her in that were not that far from maybe a situation I was in real life, but I chose to go this way and I had her go the other way. Um, and so there are, it was funny, my mom, when she was reading it, um, and like, you know, it's not a huge part of the book, but I did want to make sure Amanda had like a healthy relationship with her parents in this open dialogue. And my mom was funny because she was just sort of like, there were some parts that were hard to read. Like, you know, <laughs> just, just because she, you know, she, there were certain moments where it's like we were having a conversation. Um, but again, as I mentioned, like Amanda left the conversation saying, okay, I'm going to do this very dumb thing. And I left the conversation being like, oh, yikes, like I should probably wake up and change some of my, my decisions. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think probably Amanda but hopefully I'm a little bit more likable than her. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't find her unlikable. Just like There's a moment she's very unpalatable, I think. Un yes, but when she does those things, you understand why she's doing yeah. them. Yeah. And maybe you did them yourself when you were 12. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, so the book is composed of three different types of sections. So there's like past when they're 12, modern day when um, she's in her early 20s. Yep. And then the sort of interstitial, mysterious texts and emails. Can you talk about how you structured the book or if that was your original intent to have dual timeline with these blips in between or if you played around with that? So when I first started working on the draft, um, I actually very early on thought that it was going to be a middle grade novel oh. that was um, kind of like a... Um, female version of The Body by Stephen King, which is what Stand By Me, the movie, is um, is based on. And so I first messed around with that. That's when I had like the varying POVs and all the different girls, and they would get lost in the woods and kind of find their, their way back together. Um, and I finished that draft, and I went to a writing retreat in California. And the um, author in residence at this retreat was Stephanie Dandler, who wrote Sweet Bitter. And we were sitting there and chatting and like, you know, having our wine. It was great. And she just looked at me and she's like, you don't want to write a middle grade novel, do you? And I was like, <laughs> no, what do I do? You know, and it was funny because that, that's when I went back to the drawing board. And in earlier versions, that's when I started doing like basically the dual timeline. And as I was writing it and I just felt, as I mentioned, I don't view my book as a pure thriller, but it is suspense. And I felt that there was a lot of focus on the character development of these girls and whatnot, but there wasn't enough of a consistent like thread that helped mm -hmm. basically um, weave the tension mm -hmm. throughout. So that's when I first started coming up with this idea of um, how do I essentially foreshadow the twist at the end in, in a way that also keeps the reader engaged, thinking like, what is going to happen like mm -hmm. to these girls who seem very happy at summer camp and in their 20s and, and whatnot? Um, so I would say I, I probably got about 75% of the way through um, really like polishing the, the dual timeline. And then that's when I started adding in the interstitials and, and figuring out, at that point too, I had figured out the ending. So that helped a lot because I think before that I was a little bit like, 
Yeah. I don't know. Something something's missing, but I'm not sure what. Um, so it probably was. Oh gosh, I don't know. Like a year before I I maybe even like six months before I signed with my agent that I really started like um, putting those in. So it's not that they were an afterthought, but they felt like a cherry on top in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it helps the propulsion yeah. of the novel. So you're, um, this is your first novel and you've published a lot of nonfiction articles. So how do you, uh, were you always kind of wanting to write a novel or working one on one in the background or it just, just kind of came out of nowhere? Um, I definitely would say I've been the storyteller of our family for a long time. <laughs> so I, um, I always had dreams of, of being a novelist. Um, but I think there was a part of me, um, especially when I was in college and shortly after, that just thought, like, how on earth am I going to make a living doing this? Um, which even still today, yes, I feel yeah. that way. Um, but in all seriousness, like, I... I would just kind of work on stories. I had this um, this notebook when I was in um, like junior high, um, and I remember this because I now have given it to my son because I didn't fill it all out. But it was like a fluffy Winnie the Pooh ridiculous notebook, and because it was so innocent, I thought like, oh, I can write like all my stories in here and whatnot. And I found it when um, we were moving. I think I guess my parents were moving somewhere. I forget. Um, they moved like a zillion places in the past few years, and. Um, I opened it up and I was like, oh wow, I was like writing fiction mm -hmm. at that age. Like they were horrible, ridiculous <laughs> stories that were just like fictionalized versions of like small dramas that had mm -hmm. happened in life. But, um, but it was really funny to kind of reread those. And then I would sort of like work on some stuff, I think in high school and college um, and in my early 20s. But as I mentioned, like none of it just really stuck and I felt like, oh, I don't know. And so when I ended up pursuing journalism, for a while, I thought I had a nonfiction agent. I thought I was going to be sort of writing nonfiction books. Um, but I remember when I first met with my initial nonfiction agent, and I was like 22 or 23, um, and I didn't understand. He, he published like very minimal amounts of fiction um, or helped publish. And I said to him, I was like, well, like, I kind of want to write fiction. And he was like, all right. Uh. Like, it was like, that's not why I want to work with you. Um, and so I just kind of tabled that for a bit. I worked on some nonfiction proposals with him. And it was actually when I started working at Bloomberg, um, which I had a stint. I was at Fortune, then Bloomberg, and then Marie Claire before I went kind of full-time freelance. Um, I loved Bloomberg, but it was very corporate. And I was writing less there. I was doing a lot of editorial events. And I just felt like I really needed an outlet. Um, and I needed to be able to, to just let my mind, you know, run in a way. And I, I wanted to make sure I wasn't losing that writing muscle. Um, so that's when I started, not on the wild one, but I started working on like some short stories, some um, more like pure fiction types of projects. Um, and then when I joined Marie Claire in 2016, that's when I really like felt the writing there was, the nonfiction writing was a bit more creative and, and more like narrative nonfiction mm -hmm. there than it had been at the, the previous places I'd been. And um, my editors there were just fantastic. And we were also covering books. And I got to interview a bunch of authors and profile some. And it just was the spark I think I needed of like, yeah. I can do this. You know, I, I can really figure this out. Um, so it was a winding path, but eventually found my way. <laughs> so as a fellow um, pandemic debuter, which is a terrible club to be in, <laughs> <laughs> what, was, what was this book's journey from conception to publication? Oh my gosh. Um, okay, so I started writing it, like really writing it in, I guess I had early versions of it in like 2017. 2018 was when I started writing what would eventually be The Wild One, like really not just the, I think in a way I, I view the previous year as like character studies without realizing it. Um, and then I sold, I signed with my agent in 2019 and um, I was, a month and a half away from having my first son. Um, and Michelle, my agent at the time, was also pregnant. So that was kind of an interesting journey for both of us. Um, and that was nice. So we knew because of our timing that we would probably have about a year between edits and raising children <laughs> and all of that um, before we took it to publishers. So that's 2019. I quit my job at Marie Claire in January of 2020 uh -huh because I lined up a few freelance gigs yeah. and I was like ready to go. Um, and I knew that we were going to aim to sell the book shortly um, into the year. And then COVID hit, so that was fun. 
Um, but we actually, Michelle and I, ended up taking the book out the week after Tom Hanks had COVID. Oh. Let's, I remember it so distinctly. It was just <laughs> this very, we were like, oh, the Hanks. Like, you know, this is when everybody thought it was just going to be like a month, yeah. if that. And my editor always talks about how it was, we went out a day after the entire publishing industry announced that they were all working from home. Mm -hmm. And it was a risk. We had no idea um, if it was the right move or not. And it ended up being weirdly great because the sort of, my editor was saying like, she at that point, because so much was in flux, especially with books that sh she had already, you know, was already working on and was publishing, she had more reading time um, because a lot was on hold with what sort of the launch plans were for the yeah. books that they already had out. And so, um, so that happened really quickly. I, I went out, we went out that week and I ended up, um, basically getting an offer, I wanna say like a week and a half or two weeks later um, from Harper and there were a few, it was sort of a, a preempt, um, there were three editors within Harper Collins that were interested and then kind of chatted with them um, and ended up going with Sarah Stein at Harper. Um, but Sarah, we, there was a lot that we didn't know and so two of the editors that we had chatted with were interested in like, you know, a y publishing it a year out um, and Sarah had said two years and I remember at the time being like, really like her I like her vision but like two years is so long yeah. <laughs> now I'm learning and publishing that's not yeah. at all so it's good um, but yeah so it really it's been quite a, a lengthy process in terms of you know all of that um, and I think in general the pandemic has just been weird because as you know like it's just we didn't even know if we'd be able to do in-person events yeah. this summer um, and obviously with like different waves that were coming yeah. with COVID we had no idea. I had a ton of friends who had books come out last summer and they thought be, they'd be able to do in-person events mm -hmm. and then couldn't. And it's just, um, there's been so much unpredictability and also just weird consumer behavior as well of like not fully knowing what people want to consume, how they want to consume it, what they're interested in. Um, I remember like last year, one of my friends was um, going on submission with a book and everybody was like, we just want like beach reads. We mm -hmm. want like happy, mm -hmm. no pandemic talk beach reads. Um, and then this, you know, it's just kind of interesting how um, obviously the world has shaped what people are, are interested in and consuming. Um, and so it's, yeah, it's been a wild ride for sure. Yeah, I had similarly like ready to go on submission the first week of March, 2020. Yeah. And then we pushed it off <sighs> for that reason. I mean, I, and I think like if you were early pandemic, you kind of got in before everything went oh, economic turned on. Yeah. A couple more questions. <laughs> no, no. Um, do you have a favorite representation of camp in pop culture, TV, movie, um, book? I love The Interestings by Meg Wolitzer. Oh, I love that it's book. one of my favorite books yeah. of all time. Um, and I think in lit, like in terms of lit that I would say that's probably my favorite. Um, and in turn, I, I am obsessed with The Parent Trap, Lindsay Lohan oh, slash Nancy Myers yeah. version in particular. <laughs> Love it. Great I could film. watch it forever and ever. Um, and this is also, this show, like, underrated, but there was a show, I forget the network, that was on when I was first in New York, because I remember my roommate Kelsey and I used to watch it all the time, and it was just called Camp. And it had like an entire Australian cast who all pretended that they were American, but it was like, it was so good. And we, every single, whatever night to say, it was like on a Wednesday night, we like get home from work and like get a bottle of wine and like sit down and we loved it. And it was like a ridiculous sort of like soapy, kind of funny show, only one season, but it was awesome. And I feel like that was super underrated as well. Have you ever seen Bug Juice? Uh, love oh, Bug Juice. Really good show. Love I Bug Juice. I, I like. I wanted to be Cammy from Bug Juice it for a was while. So innocent too. Yeah, it was so innocent and just. Um, it was funny after. It was after I had finished a draft of this, but I think it was during COVID. Like there was so much um, sort of like nostalgia digging in, especially in the beginning of COVID, and um, I can't remember the publication, but they post they published an interview with one of the girls from Bug Juice who had like gotten mysteriously kicked out of camp, and I was like. <laughs> 
<laughs> what did she do? Yeah, <laughs> I forget. I think like somehow there might have been like weed in her bag or okay. something. It was it's just, it, but they made it seem very dramatic on the yeah. show. Um, and yeah, it was just one of those things where like apparently people still try and find her on social media to like ask her <laughs> what <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whatever happened to the shoes girl. So one final question, which is the inevitable. What are you working on now? So um, shortly before The Wild One came out, we sold my next two books to Harper, uh, to my same editor. And so the, the next book I have coming out will be summer 2024, and it's called Riptide. And it is about two sisters who grew up in this small South Jersey beach town. And the older sister, um, we don't really know what happened, but after high school, she left never to return, you know, minus uh, the occasional visit to her family. Um, and the younger sister and her family have been like running the family business. And after 15 years away, the older sister returns um, to essentially help take over the family business um, and have her parents retire. And so really the book is about, um, you know, the Trump, the sort of the, the scars left behind of tumultuous like high school relationships, uh, small town gossip and the scars that can leave, and then um, settling old scores. So, because as, as we know from the wild one, I do love a good revenge fantasy. <laughs> so, so there's a bit of that as well. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So we have a little time for questions. If you want to come up to the mic, anyone? <laughs> Thanks, Brittany. <laughs> so I think about this a lot because we're writing books and stuff. So for your next one, if you could have any one blurb it, any writer, who it, who would it be? Because you had Megan Abbott for The Wild One, which is pretty Yeah, which was my huge. dream. Like, yeah. I, I will never forget. I got to profile Megan Abbott for um, for Marie Claire uh, shortly before I, I left. And my whole team there used to make fun of the fact that I was more excited for, like, that than literally <laughs> interviewing, like, Mila Kunis or Jennifer Aniston or any of those people. I was like, oh, my God, guys, it's Megan Abbott, <laughs> um, which was pretty funny. Um, but... You know, I think, especially because it's a beach read, um, I don't know. I've talked to my team about this a little bit. I think, uh, like, Ellen Hildebrand would be kind of amazing. Yeah. Um, just because, obviously, she's the queen of beach reads, but also a lot of her books, people talk about them like they're just, like, all rainbows and sunshine, but they're not. Um, and so I just, I grew up, my mom's obsessed with her, so I grew up reading a lot of her books. Um... So I think probably her. I'm trying to think of who else, though. I mean, I, I sort of have the list in my head, but I, I feel like she would just be the sort of pinnacle of yeah. blurbhood. <laughs> no, that would be, yeah, that would be amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyone else? I know, I was going to say, Kelly... Kelly probably. I think Kelly's been like to mo almost most of my events now. So you you should have like a backlog of questions to I ask. Answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly, which character is based on you? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Do you want to talk about what that third book is about? Oh, uh, I don't know if I can because I have oh. no idea. If, well, I, I I think I can at least say that one of the things. Um, I'm trying to do with each of my books is I, I obviously really um, like intense atmospheres and setting that's really strong and is a character in and of itself. So in the next one, the beach certainly will be that that piece of things. And I think my third will be um, academia, which is why like oh. your book is I mean totally like hopefully a comp in a way. <laughs> um, but it it's academia and probably in DC as well since totally. I went to school here. Um, and I would say the way I've sort of been describing it thus far, there is a game theory class and, um, a dead professor. And I would say I've been kind of, uh, describing it as like Lucy Foley meets, um, secret history. Uh -huh. So to be determined, cause you know, I might come back like, uh, yeah, two years and I'll be yeah. like, oh, it's actually set at like in California and yeah. like the mountains. I don't know. But um, but that's the hope right now. So we will see. What about you? What are you working on? Uh, I'm working. It's not announced yet, but it's uh, like um, a mystery with some supernatural elements, actually sort of in the line of Stephen King's It about um, oh high school kids um, witness a mass murder in their small town that's kind of run by this mega church. And then they end up um, killing the pastor of this mega church, and then they have to come back 
20 years later because he's still alive somehow even though they killed him Ooh, that sounds really good so it's due january 6th <laughs> so i gotta <laughs> finish it i was gonna say yeah <laughs> yeah yeah it's easy to remember good. yeah that's that sounds really really good though Questions? Okay. Well, thank you guys yeah, for coming. Thank you for coming. <laughs>